I don't believe our great football club is worth the money the current owners are placing on our Manchester United. And I'll tell you why in a moment. Their shareholding will be available because they will be seeking an exit now. Because no normal human being can stand the sort of pressure they are now under. You've only got to look at the expression on the players' faces. This is Manchester United. Look at the first two games. They look like rabbits in the headlines. They look frightened. You then look at the new manager. God bless him. Uh, what, a, what a gauntlet he's being handed. And he looks hapless and concerned. He's got a massive job. Uh, but it's the infrastructure that is wrong. So short, short answer then. Yeah. Will the Glazers be gone by the end of the season? Yes, that's my prediction. Michael, one of my biggest criticisms of the Glazers has been that they never talk to the fans in 17 years. I don't think we've heard from them. Since the consortium bid has been leaked, since we've started talking about it, since it's gone to the public domain, it's kind of gone crazy on social media and you've been engaging with the fans. I mean, you're kind of the opposite of the Glazers, but why have you done that? John, every football club is, are the fans. You have to engage. You have to have dialogue. Uh, you have to ignore, obviously, any silly behaviour. But with sensible fans, intelligent fans, who just want answers, you've got to engage. And that's been my simple philosophy. Engage, try and help them to understand as best you can. That's my style. Now, one of the things that has happened, we've got a lot of questions that have come out on the internet. And because you haven't done lots of interviews, mm. people are starting to you know, doubt what's happening. So we're going to go through some of the questions that we've seen on the internet. And I think that's the best way of answering the fans directly. So I think the first question that's been asked by most people mm. is what's the time scale like? Yeah, look, these are very good, sound, legitimate questions. And of course fans want to know, almost a blow-by-blow -blow account. What I want to stress is this. Trying to put a bid together to buy Manchester United is not like popping into the local supermarket to get your weekly groceries. Manchester United is a huge commercial proposition. To put it in layman terms, I could buy Buckingham Palace, the home of Queen Elizabeth, and her Balmoral estate, and 50,000 acres that come with it, for less money than you can buy Manchester United. So, to put a deal together, a serious deal, a proper deal, a commercial deal, just to get the current owners around the table, is no mean task. It's not easy. I've been working on this, as you know, for some time, starting from scratch, and it's been difficult. And look, every fan out there, of course, they want to see uh, a nation-state sovereign fund, preferably from an oil-rich country, a la Newcastle United, Manchester City. Or they want to see Jeff Bezos of Amazon or Elon Musk of Tesla. Of course they do, because they can then dream about the amount of endless money tree that can continue to be shaken forevermore. The MK Sortium is not in that league, and I said that from day one. I have gathered together through the contacts that I've had in the city for more than 30 years, and from friends and people I know, very high net worth individuals, they are billionaires, and there are three involved, and I'll tell you why they can't come out in public in a moment. But even with all that collective wealth, and here's a, an interesting oxymoron for you, I've got small billionaires, which sounds absurd. And it puts it in perspective when you consider the value that the current owners place on their shareholding. I don't believe our great football club is worth the money the current owners are placing on our Manchester United, and I'll tell you why in a moment. But even our collective wealth, together with the MK Consortium, does not have the wealth of the great Sir Jim Ratcliffe, for example. Those who say, well, if he's got the money, why does he keep mentioning Jim Ratcliffe? Because Jim has a lot more money than the collective that I've put together. And it's not just buying out the Glazer shareholding, the 75% equity that they currently command, you've got to refurbish the stadium. 
you've got to buy players. And for those who said, oh, well, he said this in 89 and he didn't have the money then, well, they just don't know history and they believe fallacious fake news. Because, of course, I had the money and it was my money. It wasn't my backers' money, it was my money. And, to be fair, the Bank of Scotland's as well. But these deals take time. And we are so far down the road, the skeleton of a document is being drawn up, but we will not go and place an offer in front of the ownership until everyone in the consortium gives the green light and is ready. That's the answer, John. We're going to come back to some of those points a little bit later, but I just want to be a little bit harder on you this time. Yes, and of course. You haven't really answered the question so far when yeah. we talk about the time scale. Are we talking about this season before Christmas? Right. What's, what's your interpretation? Okay. okay. I'm prepared to put my head on the block. These owners, I believe, will have sought an exit from Manchester United before or at the end of the season. They cannot be happy with their position. They know they're under enormous criticism, and quite rightly, it's legitimate criticism. It's nothing personal for me. I think I say that every time. It's nothing personal with me against the Glazer family. But their shareholding will be available because they will be seeking an exit now. Because no normal human being can stand the sort of pressure they are now under. You've only got to look at the expression on the players' faces. This is Manchester United. Look at the first two games. They look like rabbits in the headlines. They look frightened. You then look at the new manager. God bless him. Uh, what, a, what a gauntlet he's being handed. And he looks hapless and concerned. He's got a massive job. Uh, but it's the infrastructure that is wrong. So short, short answer then. Yeah. Will the Glazers be gone by the end of the season? Yes, that's my prediction. And what about the, one of the other big questions that everybody's asking on the internet is why are these backers silent? Why can't we know who they are? Yes. The silent nights, let me tell you, right. I am not in their league financially. I'm not a billionaire. I've made a bob or two. I certainly had enough money to buy Manchester United when it was only 20 million. Uh, I couldn't write a check. There's not many people on the planet, John, can write a check for the sort of value the current owners are, uh, are seeking or would seek if, it was a, if they were serious about uh, going to the market. But you can't expect people... Look, for example, at the abuse I've had. Uh, when I was approached by some excellent fan groups and an equity funder and some of my friends say, Michael, you're the man to front this, to be our spokesperson... I had to think long and hard about this, John. You know, it's taken me 25 years to shake off the fallacious, the libelous, the malicious picture of Michael Knighton that the Robert Maxwell uh, newspaper painted all those years ago. Uh, I had to think long and hard. Do I really want to stick my head above the parapet? Because I knew there'd be those working for the Daily Mirror, uh, like poor David Anderson, who did that piece... You know, the circus has come to town and he made a statement in his piece. He failed to come up with the money. No, David, if you're listening to this piece, I didn't fail to come up with the money. I had the money. But I elected to abort my deal, really, to try and stop the enormously bad press that that newspaper was bringing to the fore when it was owned by Robert Maxwell, uh, who was awesomely powerful, as we know then, of course, he was exposed as a fraud and a bully and he mysteriously fell from the ship. Um, his daughter now, Ghislaine, as we've said, rightly or wrongly, is also having her own problems with the Epstein scandal. People don't know the story. They should read Philip Vine's book. I don't get royalties. I have nothing to do with that book. He's a clever man. He's a Cambridge University graduate, a serious writer, an award-winning writer. He didn't do a David Anderson and just regurgitated fallacious stories of 30 years ago. He went to speak to Sir Angus Grossart, the chairman of Noble Grossart Bank. There are photographs in that book of Sir Angus, former chairman of the National Gallery in Scotland, the Portrait Gallery, hugely respected man, 
And he's quoted saying, yes, Michael did have the money. In fact, he had a lot more than he needed. It's all in that book, published three years ago. It's never been sued. No one's even criticised it, because it's the truth. Uh, but, as you know, some of the media will never let the facts of a story get in the way of a good story. I was prepared to suffer the inevitable rubbish that would be printed, the inevitable fallacious lies and libelous statements. No, I haven't rushed to sue anybody. My lawyers want me to. They do. They on the phone every day say, Michael, are you suing this person, that person? No, I'm not. I'm no Rebecca Vardy. As far as I'm concerned, I don't want to sue anybody. I just want the fans of my club, Manchester United, to come together, all of them, and support the bid, because we need them. Uh, we really need, need them, and that's why I've been vocal about it so often. So going back to the silent nights, are they always going to be silent and anonymous in the background? And if they are, is it really important? Because we'll have somebody else at the front of the consortium, who'll, when it does go public, they'll be, somebody yes. else will be the face. Yep. Absolutely. Look, I am the spokesperson. I was approached to front this MK consortium bid. But there are, the people I'm dealing with are public figures. They are well known. Uh, they're a lot wealthier than I am. And let me tell you, the equity funders that I'm dealing with, hugely respected in the city. Uh, but they want to make sure that all is in order and we're ready to be launched. As you know, uh, the referee blew the whistle slightly ahead of time and the ball was kicked off before we were ready with the last video we did. And that went sort of viral, uh, unbeknown to us, because we've done other videos and none of the media have picked it up. I said from day one, someone had to make a stand against this current, current ownership. I thought long and hard about it. Um, for those who said, oh, he just wants 15 minutes of fame, let me tell you, I've turned down in the last, only recently, the last five, six, ten years, thousands of interviews to be on television, to go on reality TV programmes, to go on radio programmes. I've declined them all. Uh, when you've been the front page and the back page for more than the best part of a year, as I was 30 years ago, you have no desire, trust me, to be in the public eye again. And as I say, it's unfortunate that people refer to completely fallacious and untrue stories. And that was a risk. But, you know, the football club is more important to me even than my own reputation. I'm not bothered whether people like me or dislike me. I don't, I'm not interested. It's not about me. It's about trying to put a new ownership in charge of the great Manchester United. This is a, an international institution. It's hugely respected and admired and revered worldwide. And I can't sit back any longer and see it being destroyed. I'm sure that's not the Glazers' intention to destroy it. Why would it be? But I'm afraid the reality is it's a legitimate concern. And they must now know the end is nigh. They've run out of road. And it's a legitimate criticism, John, to say you can't keep taking 20, 30, 40 millions of pounds a year in dividends, personal dividends, and servicing your best part of half a billion pounds worth of debt out of the club's money. You can't keep doing that when our competitors, Newcastle now, Manchester City, uh, Liverpool, Tottenham Hotspur, Arsenal, they are not doing it. And this is why we're becoming an also ran. I couldn't stand by and let this continue. It's not about Michael Knighton. Um, those who were not on solids when I was uh, around 30 years ago, now you see them on social media. I don't care what they're doing and saying. In fact, it's a great family source of entertainment. We like to read them in the evening and we smile. But, you know, as long as they support the bid, I'm not bothered. They can criticise. My role is to replace this current ownership. That's it. So going back to the silent nights, I was looking for a shorter answer this time. Are they always going to be silent? And if they are, is that important? It's not important. The, the short answer is, no, they won't always be silent. And when the bid is finally ready to be officially launched, 
there'll be suited and booted and city figures presenting this bid, uh, backed by, you know, what's called the magic circle of lawyers, uh, because that's how the city operates. It'll have a top-class law firm, top-class financial chartered accountants with their financial team. Of course it will. That's how these deals are done. As I say, fans have got to try and understand. I said again, this is not popping into local supermarket. This is buying perhaps the most, well, no, it is. It's the most famous, the most magical football club in the whole world. And you need billions to even get round the table. I, as I've said, check Buckingham Palace and Balmoral out. It's about half the price of what the Glazers want for their shares. So that should help people to understand these deals often take more than two, three, four years to put together. I've put this consortium together in six months. Sounds a long time. To do that is extraordinary. And we are beavering away every single day. One of the conditions that my consortium had was, Michael, we need the fan base. That's what we need. We need support. And also, my own condition was to the consortium, so long as the fans have a block of shares of 25.1%, which means they will have a real say in how Manchester United is governed going forward. That was my only condition. I never took one single half apney out of Manchester United during all my time as a director. I left the club with millions of pounds in the bank, with the ability to buy any player in the world, and we had a fabulous stadium. That's all gone. It's all gone in the last 20 years. It's gone. And I hold the current ownership responsible for that. So what about Sir Jim Ratcliffe? You've mentioned him quite a bit. Where does he fit in? Why does he need you if he wants to buy Manchester United? Jim doesn't need me. So the great Sir Jim Ratcliffe certainly doesn't need me. And I know there are those out there say, oh, well, if he's got the money or he's got billionaire consortium, why do they keep mentioning Sir Jim Ratcliffe? Well, I'll tell you, I'll repeat as we started this interview. We're not a nation state sovereign fund that have billions and billions of, say, oil revenue coming in daily. We are not Elon Musk. We are not Jeff Bezos. We are not Jack Marseille of China, great supporter. Jack's got his own problems in in, in, in China at the moment. We are a consortium, yes, it sounds absurd to say, a, a, a group of small billionaires. It, it, it sounds a nonsense. But we don't have those resources to do what our club now requires. So I always plead for Jim Ratcliffe to step forward and because Jim's gone public, I've said this before, he doesn't need to take a penny out of Manchester United. He said if he bought Chelsea, doesn't need to take half a penny. Just like I didn't need to take half a penny in 89 to 92. Not, not a single penny did I take. G Jim Ratcliffe has said the same. If he buys a football club, it'll be his money. He's prepared to invest. And he's got the financial deep resources that my consortium don't have. I mean, they just don't. Uh, but they're still hugely wealthy. It is a billionaire offer, but it's not at the level of the great Sir Jim Ratcliffe. And that's why I lobby for Jim Ratcliffe to join us or just gently, politely say, step aside, let me step in and buy the club where I was born, the club that I support, and let's ease the pain. Let's ease the horrible situation that our great football club finds itself. Let's do that. One more thing, I will just say this. For those who say, oh, well, look what he did for Carlisle. Again, most people, they never mention the amount of silverware we won when I was at Carlisle. They never mention that in the early days we were making more money than Liverpool Football Club because I implied the blueprint there. They never mentioned that. They never mentioned that the City Council, because I took them to Wembley twice, for the first time in their history, the first time, one of the greatest days of my life, in front of 75,000 people. And I must tell you, they never mention that. They say, oh, look what he did there. Again, it's people who can't be bothered to do the research, can't give a balanced view. 
And at that level, yes, it's peaks and troughs, it's ups and downs. Of course it is. Uh, I invested heavily in that football club and I can prove that. I transformed it in so many ways. And I'm proud of my legacy at that football club. I don't care what anyone says. And you know, when I go into Carlisle, I get a fantastic reception, as I did last October. Sell-out ticket. I did a charity do for the, for, for, for the uh, Tony Hopper family. Poor boy died of a serious disease, was a young man. And uh, it was the first time I'd gone back, uh, uh, because it was for Tony, an ex-player of ours, and uh, to support his family. And it was a great night. I didn't have one dissenting voice. And I went to the match the next day. Not one dissenting voice, save surprisingly enough for the News and Star reporter, who wondered why I was there. I mean, really, you know, uh, it makes you wonder how they can lie straight in bed or how they get up. There's no need for that. I want every Manchester United fan to trust this offer. We're not the richest consortium in the world, far from it. But I've made a stand. And I, frankly, was prepared to raise my head above that parapet, knowing that the social media would go wild. Social media didn't exist 30 years ago. Of course some of it's vile. Just ignore it. It has zero effect on me, zero. Just ignore it. You've covered off some of the abuse you've had on social media regarding Carlisle. You've handled that very nicely. Some of the other questions that were seen on social yes. media are about, you know, one thing is getting hold of the football club, the other thing is about a fix the things that are wrong with the team, the stadium, the training ground, etc. So is there potentially here a two-step strategy whereby step one is getting hold of the football club, step two is getting more money in to fix the stadium, to fix the team, to fix the training ground? 100%. First stage, phase one. Let's have a change of ownership. I'll say again, nothing personal against the Glazers. Let's just have people in there that understand the whole legacy concept of the great Manchester United. Let's have people that can weld together the whole of the United worldwide supporters. Let's be completely transparent with them. Let's engage with them. Let's rid ourselves of this awful debt. And then, clearly, if we haven't got the funds, but a Jim Ratcliffe or a, a hugely wealthy billionaire comes along and says, I can help you do phase two, three and four. Let's refurbish Old Trafford. I want to stay at Old Trafford. I must tell you, I don't want to ever relocate. Old Trafford is about the heritage. It's your Duncan Edwards, Nobby Style, Sir Matt Busby, Alex Ferguson, George Best, Bobby Charlton, Dennis Law. It's, it's the shrine. It is the theatre of dreams. And I would always want to stay at Old Trafford. Uh, but yes, you're right, John. It's phase one, two, three and four. And we're going to need further help to do two, three and four. But it'll come. It will come. That's fantastic. I think the next question, which has come up a lot on the internet, and I think you've probably got a quick answer to this one, is when the news of the potential bid was leaked, the share prices went up by 12%. What's the response to that? Look, whenever you've got a stock, listed, a stock market listed company, and as we all know, there are... Uh, there's a, a, a parcel of shares which are listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Whenever there is a leaked potential bid about any equity stake, any share in any company, whether it's a chemical company, whether it's a company that manufactures ball bearings, whether it's a football club, there'll be a spike because those shareholders are rubbing their hands saying, wow, we're in for a payday, we're in for a dividend, let the share price shoot up. I think it went up on the day it was leaked to about 11, by 11.9 or 12%. Of course it did. But let me tell you, as quickly as those peaks shoot up, they fall back into a trough. I do not believe Manchester United is worth the value that the current owners are rumoured to be placing upon its shares. They must also realise they are doing enormous damage to its brand value to its shares that are both on the stock market and their own shareholding. This is why they must be looking for an exit. They must be looking for an exit. Yes, they'll want top dollar. Of course they will. Everyone does. But I must tell you, their inflated 
personal valuation they're putting on their shareholding is not in the real world. The true value now of those shares are much less than they are hoping for. And you know if you can get 10, 20 worldwide Manchester United supporters behind a particular bid telling them that their time is up, they've run out of road, and when their key sponsors are nervous about what this movement is doing to their own brands, trust me, they will go. As someone who's experienced on a very micro scale, similar, I was there for 10 years, Carlisle. Six, seven fantastic, brilliant years. Huge success. No one mentions a runaway championship year. No one mentions the Wembley visits. No one mentions we were making more money than Liverpool. There are only the trolls that might pick up the odd, depressing story. But at that level, let me tell you, I knew when my position was untenable. Uh, you cannot control the narrative. You cannot control the views of certain fans. And if the media and if your sponsors are telling you it's time to move on, you have no choice. You must move on. And I did, in my own micro little way. Let's move on from Carlisle. I know we have covered yes. why you went to Carlisle in the first place in another video. Yes. And you went there partly because you believe in the pyramid. So you went from the biggest club to the one that was 92nd. It made sense. You wanted to prove that you believed in the pyramid. Yeah. But I think now a lot of people, we've answered quite a lot of the yes. questions from the internet, which yes. I think is good. There'll be more questions to come, but we yes. think we've answered the, the, the most common ones. People want to hear from me from different media organisations. I know you've turned down over 200 yes. interview requests yes. over the past week, but you're starting to do the big interviews now. You've done yes. something with Granada. And I personally am not a big fan of fan channels because I think they cause a lot of division yes. within our fan base. Sadly, yes. But they have got a voice and you can't do them all, but you've decided to do a piece with the biggest fan channel for Manchester United, which is the United Stand. Tell us about why yeah. you're going to speak to them. Well, look, my apologies to all those podcasters out there that have put in requests. It's impossible. I simply haven't got the time to go on every fan podcast. Um, and my mistake was I should have done my own podcast years ago when my youngest son said, Dad, you've got to get on a podcast. I never did. But they are important. Podcasters, it's the way of exchanging immediate information. And I've been approached. Uh, yes, I am doing the, uh, v uh, the very influential podcast. And I'll answer any question. I've got no questions that I'm averting. None. I want to be as transparent as I can. I want to talk to fans. Because, John, this is a f as much a fan bid as, as it is a Michael Knight and Consortium bid. Because we can't do it without the fans. We just can't. Hence why I juggled the ball all those years ago to show them, look, I'm not just a businessman. I'm a football fan first, businessman second. That's the reason I went on the pitch, to show them I'm one of you. I'm off the terraces. I'm a football fan. And there was no other motivation than that, because there was a disconnect at the time between that ownership and the fans, and I wanted to repair that disconnect. And until Maxwell got his hands on, on the narrative, it worked for a short time. I wanted, wow, this is going to be an interesting and fascinating ride. In my kit bag, of course, was a blueprint. Uh, the fans didn't know that at the time, and I gave that blueprint Blueprint one. It's in the book of. It's in the back of that book as an appendix that was written. Everyone, everyone can read it. it. Looks very dated now, but that was the blueprint I gave Manchester United to turn in, into or play its part into turning it from a failed company as it was a failed business, no brand market really. Thirty odd years ago, in my blueprint. I actually say, I'm going to turn Manchester United into the greatest sporting brand the world's ever seen. You remember, as a journalist, I was slaughtered in the media. How dare Michael Knighton refer to Manchester United as a brand? Well, I think they know better now. And the whole industry now works on its brand. They have to have a global brand reach. And that was my concept all those years ago. And it worked. Uh, after a few years, it was raining money. I also knew that it would start to rain silverware because when I went there, the cupboard was virtually bare. No championship, 
no, very little silverware. And yet, as I said before, I was there when Alex Ferguson won his first trophy. The FA Cup, then the Football League Cup, the European Cup Winners' Cup, the European Super Cup, the Charity Shield joint owners with our die-hard enemy. And even the FA Youth Cup of 92, it was all there. I only left because of what was happening with the big six then breakaway. I wanted the Premier League, but I wanted them to share the money properly. That's what I wanted. And I said, I'm leaving. And I'm going to the rock bottom football club, uh, which was Carlisle, of course. I, I, I stood by my principles and I'm standing by my principles now. I don't give tuppence what they're saying or writing about me. It's not about me. It's about my football club. And I say my, Manchester United will always be part of my life. Always. And there's no question about that. My blood is red. It's bound to be. Too much emotional attachment, too many experiences. And I'm so proud of my contribution to this great institution. I couldn't stand back anymore and see it, its demise unfold before my eyes. Very few people believe me. Well, a year ago when I said there's something radically wrong here, I said the executive structure was wrong. I said the ownership was wrong. Now they believe me. Now they believe me. It's a shambles. Something's got to change. Michael Knighton will change it. It will happen. We'll have new owners before the end of the season. That's absolutely brilliant, Michael. You've answered all the questions that we've had from the fans off the internet. I've been working in the media 45 years. I can feel your passion. I can feel your honesty. I thank you for trusting me to ask these questions. And I believe that there's no question that you can't answer. None. Absolutely none. The only thing I can't do is reveal the identity of those billionaires. And I understand why. They've got a far bigger profile than me, believe me. And certainly for a city institution like the equity fund managers. And look, they've got more than three billion pounds under management. It's not their money, remember, it's their investors. Do you think that a city, a blue chip city institution, want to experience the garbage that I've experienced, printed by some ill-informed, reckless journalists? Of course they don't. I was prepared to take that. Yes, I've got grandchildren, eight grandchildren. I've got my own children to think of. My own reputation. Doesn't matter when you see what's happening to Manchester United. And that's why I had to make a stand and come out. Not about me, it's not about fame. Goodness me, I've had 15 billion hours of fame. I don't need any more. As you know, I became a recluse and said I would never get involved at this level again. I had to, I just had to, because we're in crisis. We need new owners. But John, we need the fans. That's why I've asked for help. Not money, not financially. I don't want a penny from the fans. I need their vocal support. I need peaceful protest. Please, please, please. It must be peaceful. We don't want violence. We don't want anything that is improper or illegal. Yes, we want vocal support. Yes, we want mass support. Because that is the only way they can register their disappointment, dissatisfaction. But please, no violence. Nothing that is illegal. I, I, I plead with you. I can't support that. I just want all the fans to unite, even the critics, even the trolls, forget about me, unite. Then you will have new owners. You really will. Trust me on that. Michael Knighton, until next time, thank you. My pleasure.